theyeshiva.net. We are in the middle of the introduction of the Rambam, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon, to his monumental magnum opus, halachic work, Mishnah Torah, also known as Yad HaChazaka. So please open your introduction. The previous two classes, we explored the first part of the Rambam's introduction, and today we reach the final part of his introduction. We are, by the words, Udvarim Halalu, Bidinim Gzeiriz V'takanus Ben Hagesh and Eschatshu Acher Chibur Atalmud, Acher Chibur Atalmud. We finished last time the words Ein Shaymen LeRishayn and LeLamisha Adas Noitel LeDvarav Bein Rishayn Bein Acherei. We're holding by the words Udvarim Halalu. The Rambam gave a brief and concise bird's eye view of the tradition, the development of the Messiah, of Yiddishkeit, of Torah, of Halach, of Mitzvahs, from Moshe Rabbeinu all the way through the era of the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, which was composed by Rav Ashi and his son and students and disciples. As the Rambam put it, approximately 400 years after the destruction of the second Beis HaMikdash. And the Rambam's point was that the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, was the compilation, the ultimate authoritative compilation that included not only an interpretation and elucidation of the Mishnah, but it includes also, as a result of that, all of the oral traditions, laws, customs, interpretations on all of the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah that were passed down orally from generation to generation from Moshe Rabbeinu. In addition to that also, all of the new circumstances and situations that rose up throughout the centuries and the millennia where the courts, the Sanhedrins, the Jewish courts of each generation had to delve into the pre-existing texts and laws that were received using the methodology, the formulas that they learned and received from Moshe about how to deduce new laws from the text, about how to interpret the text, known as the Midas Shatayr and Idreshes Behem. That too was included in the Talmud. Included also was also the traditions, the customs, the edicts, the decrees that were added by the courts, by the sages, by the prophets throughout the generations what we know as the rabbinic mitzvahs or rabbinic injunctions or rabbinic prohibitions, all that was included in the Babylonian Talmud. And the Rambam says afterwards, because the Sanhedrin was dissolved, the main central body of the Jewish people that combined the greatest leaders and scholars of all the segments of the Jewish community and really united the entire Jewish people under that central spiritual and legal authoritative body that was dissolved somewhere in the 400s before the composition of the Babylonian Talmud. So afterwards, there are many, many courts in many communities, but the Jews were completely scattered and diversified with uh, inability to be able to communicate or even travel and connect the way they used to do it before you didn't have the thousands and thousands of Jews coming together, learning and delving into the text of the Torah and the text of the Mishnah and so forth. And therefore he says, after that, if there is an injunction or an instruction or a safeguard protection created by one best in one court in a particular country or location, community, it binds the Jews who are living there, who follow their instruction and guidance, but not other Jews. That was, that's a very brief summation of what we learned. And he continues, let's see inside. Udvarim halalu, all this is true, bedinim, the laws, gzeris, edicts, takodais, institutions, minhagais, customs, shenishachu acher chibura talmud, acher chibura talmud, which were innovated, developed after the composition of the Babylonian Gemara, Talmud Bavli, in the 400s, the end of the 400s. But all of the items that exist in Gemara, in Talmud Babylon, the Babylonian Talmud, 
This obliges all of the Jewish people universally. The kaifen kol ir the chol medina medina linoi bechol hamin hagis shenagu chach me atalmud the ligzig zeiraisim the leches betakanaisim hayil the chol aisim hadvanim she betalmud he skimu aleim kol yisra. We compel the Jews living in every single city and in every single country and province to follow all of the traditions and customs that were instituted by the sages of the Talmud, to follow the decrees that they created, the edicts that they created, to follow their institutions, those customs and traditions that they instituted. Why? Because if it's recorded in the Talmud, it's something that was collectively agreed upon by all of Kalal Yisrael, by all of the Jewish people. Because till the time of the Talmud, you had that central body that connected and united all of the Jewish people, true, it was not like in the first commonwealth or even in the second commonwealth. That's why Rebbe wrote the Mishnah, because he saw the beginning of the dispersion of the Jewish people to far local locations, and therefore he needed to transcribe the oral tradition. But hundreds of years later, even the Sanhedrin dissolved. And once the Talmud Bavli was written subsequently, he says there's no law that is initiated and created by this central body that unites all the Jewish people and is agreed upon and embraced by all of Klal Yisrael. And therefore, you do not compel every city and every country to follow it. So that's what he says. In the Talmud Bavli, though, it was something that was agreed upon and was embraced by all of the Jewish people. Because they had that connection, they had that communication, and there was that, uh, every, things were centralized and there was a tremendous sense of unity, and there was communication, even though there was the community in Eretz Yisrael, in the Holy Land, there was community in Babylonia, Talmud Bavli was written in Babylonia, but he says you could say on it that Eskimo Aleim Kal Yisrael was agreed upon by all of the Jewish people. This comes with one more point, and that is the sages who instituted or made the decree, or made the custom, or issued the judgment, or taught that this is the right law and this is the right interpretation. Who were these people? You have all the sages of Israel, or the majority of them. And they heard the tradition of the fundamentals of Torah, the entire Torah, generation after generation, back to Moshe Rabbeinu. And therefore... You had here, when you had the Sanhedrin functioning, you had all of the sages of the Jewish people. The best, the greatest, both in terms of knowledge, in terms of scope, in terms of depth, in terms of integrity, in terms of spirituality. And these were all people who were ordained by teachers, who were ordained by teachers, who were ordained by teachers, who can trace back the lineage all the way to Moshe Rabbeinu. So they sat for years and they learned how to learn Torah, how to understand Torah, what are the oral traditions that came with Torah, what came from Moshe Rabbeinu, what was added later, what are the formulas, what are the methodology, how to deduce, how to interpret. And because of that, in this unbreakable chain and dynasty of the tradition of Torah from Moshe Rabbeinu, you can create decrees and institutions that would oblige all of Klal Yisrael, all of the Jewish people. But that's only till the time of Talmud Bavli, when you had a decision that was made not by one sage or one rabbi or a few sages or a few rabbis, but literally he says all of the sages of the entire Jewish people or more or most of them at least who came together and discussed this and debated this and then they took a vote and you followed the majority. So that has a different level of authority. And then it was communicated to all of the Jewish people who agreed. It's two elements because as we're going to see much later in Rambam and Hilchis Mamre, if the court makes an institution, but the community doesn't accept it, because it just it doesn't work. Sometimes it just doesn't work. It becomes nullified. We're going to get into that later. So Ramam here emphasizes two things. First of all, all of Klal Yisrael accepted it. Beautiful expression somebody once shared with me <laughs> that he heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe in the 1940s. He said, Klal Yisrael, there is something called Ruach HaKadosh, something called divine inspiration that certain individuals have. Every person has it, but most of us have static, so we block this inspiration. But certain people are transparent souls, so the inspiration flows through them. But he said, Kalal Yisrael hot in Yiddish, Kalal Yisrael hot, Kollektive Ruach HaKadosh. 
So just a beautiful expression. The Jewish people have collective divine inspiration. There's something called the Eskimo Kol Yisrael. The immune system of Klal Yisrael is sacred. The way Chazal put it, Yisrael Kedoshim Heim. There are holy people. Of course this one has flaws, this one has flaws, I have flaws, he has flaws, you have flaws. But Klal Yisrael has a collective Ruach HaKadosh. There's like the consensus of Klal Yisrael. Or as the Gemara says in Shabbos, there is a certain a holiness that flows through the sinews of Klal Yisrael, the body of the Jewish people. So the Rambam says, the fact that all of the Jewish people accepted these mitzvahs, these institutions of the rabbis, of the prophets, and it was initiated and created by all Chachmi Yisrael, it gives it a different level of authority. That seizes with Talmud Bavli. It's the end of an era. It's not the end of the tradition, God forbid. Not the end of Torah at all. We're sitting here today learning Rambam. And the Rambam is writing this a thousand, uh, 500 years after the Talmud Bavli was composed. More than a little, more than 500 years. But it's the end of a certain era. You have to recognize boundaries between one generation and another generation. And it's not just majority, again, I'm emphasizing these words because it gives you an appreciation of how uh, meticulous the tradition of Judaism is, how it's passed on, how everything is accounted for. There's absolutely no anarchy, there's no gaps. Everything is accounted for and it has its place. It's put in context of where it happened, when it happened, how it happened, by whom it happened. It's not just the majority of sages, it's sages who were directly linked in the chain all the way up to Moshe Rabbi. In other words, each one of those sages who was part of this collective decision can say, I learned by him and by him and by him and him, who learned by him and him, who learned by him and him, who learned all the way. You're going to get back to Yeshua, Elazar, Pinchas, the Skenim, and you ultimately get back to Moshe Rabbi. The power of that direct chain is incredible, both in terms of intellectual integrity in terms of clarity, in terms of responsibility, and in terms that you are really, there is a loyalty. In other words, I am directly continuing that chain. And because there was still a cohesiveness in the Jewish world, therefore, this infrastructure can still exist. At some point, this infrastructure could not exist anymore. And then a Sanhedrin, a single body that would govern the Jewish people, could only be something that's hijacked and abducted, and it could become actually the source of corruption. I want you to understand this. When they dissolved the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, it wasn't just a tragedy. We don't have it anymore. In many ways, it was also one of the most advantageous and beneficial decisions for the Jewish people. Because when you don't have that infrastructure that allows for the integrity of such a system, such a system could be dangerous. Because, you know, animal farm, we're all equal, but some people are more equal than others. When such a central body is abducted and hijacked by corrupt forces, now your entire nation is subject to their corruption. I don't know if you know, but Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor of France in the early 1800s, created a Sanhedrin. (laughs) He created in in the France, he got one of the great, great rabbis of the time, Rabbi David Zitzenheim, to sit at the head of the Sanhedrin, he felt he had to because Napoleon was so powerful and if not, the Jewish people would be really in trouble. And he wanted this Sanhedrin to institute new laws in Jewish life. This is, I think, 1807, right? But this was, of course, the Jews knew this was a fake Sanhedrin. This is Napoleon Sanhedrin. It's the antithesis of what the Sanhedrin was. The entire identity of Sanhedrin was absolute dedication and loyalty to the highest standards of intellectual and spiritual integrity of the tradition of Torah and Mitzvahs. So now let's see what happens next stage. All the sages who arose after the composition of the Talmud. Uvonuvoi, vonuvoi means they comprehended it, they learned it, vonu from the word bina. They analyzed it, they dissected it, they delved into it, they understood it. And they got a name because of their wisdom. They have no new title in Jewish history called Ga'inim. A Ga'in is the term that we use for a genius. They're called Ga'inim. The genius is the great scholars. It's also Ga'in is the numerology of 60. 
because Gimel is three, Aleph is one, that's four. Vav is six, so that's four, and six is ten. And Nun is fifty, sixty, because the Ga'inim had to be masters of all the sixty tractates of Shas. The Talmud is basically divided into sixty tractates. There are other divisions where it becomes sixty-three, but generally sixty tractates, and the Ga'in had to be the master of all sixty. So these are the sages in the subsequent generations of the Talmud. The Talmud began to be composed. The Rambam said, we learned earlier, in the year 470 after the Common Era, 400 years after the structure of the Second Beis HaMikdash, and it was finished somewhere at the end of the 5th century or somewhere in the 6th century, the 500s. After this begins a new era in Jewish history, the era of the Ga'inim. And this will continue for a few hundred years. All of these sages, Sha'amdu Ba'aretz Yisrael, who lived in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel, Ba'aretz Shinar, in Babylonia, Shino is Babylonia, present day Iraq, Ubisfarad in France, Ubitsarfas in Spain, Limdu Derecha Talmud, they taught Jews the path of the Talmud, Vaitsiular Talomois of Ubiaru in Yon of Lafisha, Derech, Amuka, Darke, Adlamait. They also extracted and revealed the secrets of the Talmud. They also elucidated and explained the themes of the Talmud, because the path and the voyage of Talmud is exceedingly profound. Its depth is, the Rambam says, is marvelous, is extraordinary. Adla ma'ayit. Learning Gemara is delving into a literature, a wisdom that is unique and very, very deep, complex and profound. Va'ayit. In addition to that, the language, the language is Aramaic mixed with other languages, which in the time when the Gemara was composed, that language was common and known to all of the Jews who lived in Babylonia. In other locations, and even in Babylonia, in the generations of the Ga'in and post Talmud Bavli, nobody knows that language well until they don't really learn it. So first of all, you have the language barrier. Besides the language barrier, he says you have the concept barrier. The Gemara is very, very deep. And when the Rambam is saying here the Gemara is very deep, it doesn't only mean that you have to spend time on it. For sure you have to spend time on it. It means that the surface, if you're learning it at the surface and you got it, it means you didn't get it. Because every idea... Every statement, every observation, every question, every answer, every refutation, every proof, every story, every lesson, every teaching, every law has layers and layers of depth, not only to understand the subject matter itself or the idea itself, but also to appreciate the underlying paradigms behind every one of the Talmudic sages who expounded and ideas and developed ideas. They had paradigms, and these paradigms were philosophical, psychological, theological, spiritual, and of course, legal and concrete. So it comes with tremendous amount of depth, the Gemara. And you have to know its path, you have to know its perspectives, you have to know its, its hashkaf, its veltam shawam. And every individual who's quoted in the Gemara has his own unique veltam shawam. And as a result of that, the Rambam says, the Ga'inim felt the need to explain this, both in terms of the concepts and in terms of the language. <speaking in Hebrew> Jews in every city would send many questions to the Ga'in that lived in their day in order to explain to them the difficult ideas in the Gemara. <speaking in Hebrew> And the Ga'inim would respond according to their knowledge and wisdom. And those who asked these questions, what they did was, the questionnaires, they started to compile the responses that they received from the Ga'inim, and they turned them into books. This is before the printing press, of course, but the manuscripts, books, manuscripts, which they could use to study, and they could use to learn, and they can use to guide their communities. So they would compile the answers that they received from the God who lived in their time. In addition to answering questions, the Goinim in each generation composed various halachic works to explain the Gemara. Mayhem those Mishapirish halachas yichidus. Some of them explained individual laws. Mayhem some Mishapirish prokim yichidim shnestash shabiyamav gave an explanation, they wrote an explanation to individual chapters in the Talmud, which became very difficult in his days, in the days of this God. Umehem, some of them, Yishapirish Mesechtas Zdarim, wrote a commentary to complete tractates in Gemara, or even Zdarim, complete sections in the Gemara. 
Vaid Hebrew Halachas Psukas being in his of a hetter, Vahi of a potter, but Varam Shashat Srikala. They also compose books with clear verdicts, not only explanations of the Gemara, but clear cut, clear cut halachis verdicts and issues of things that are permissible or forbidden, those who are uh, liable or those who are exonerated. The Dvanim Shashat Srikhlev and issues that were contemporary. The Jews needed to know. So that the person who cannot delve into the depth of Gemara should still have access to this knowledge. And this is the work of God that all of the Ga'inim of the Jewish people were involved in from the day that the Talmud Bavli was composed until this very time when the Rambam is writing. When is this time? The Rambam here gives us the date when he's writing these words. Shehi, this is Shana Shminis, Achamea ve'elef l'chor abais. This is the eighth year after 1,100 years passed since the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Vihi, this is Shnas Arbar Salaf Musham Meyaz Uchloishim Meshevel Abriyasayl. This is 4,907 and 37 years since the creation of the world. 4937 since the creation of the world. Now this is very important because the Rambam here gives us the date of his writing, the introduction, which would be in the secular calendar would be 1177. 1177, which in the Jewish calendar would be 4,937 since the creation of the world, right? How do we get to the year? How do I get to the year 1177? Here you right away see that the Rambam believed or understood or knew that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed in the year 70 after the Common Era. Because if it was destroyed in the year 70, let's now go a thousand years later. A thousand years later would become 1070. 1100 years, this is a thousand and a hundred. So 1100 years later would be 1170. Right? 1070 is a thousand years. 1170 is 1100 years. A thousand and one hundred years. And the Rambam says, and in the eighth year, this is the time I'm writing. The eighth year. So that would be 1177. You see, I got from 70 to 1070 to 1170. In the eighth year, 1177. What would this be in the Hebrew calendar? The destruction of the second base of Midrash was in the year 3000 since creation. 3830. So the Rambam says, now add 1000 years and 11, another 100 years, 1100 years plus the eighth year. So this would be 4937. Because if the base Hamikdash was destroyed, 3830. So add a thousand years, so it's 4830. Now add another hundred years, it's 4930. 4930 in the eighth year. So it's 4937 since creation of the world. We already started going into the eighth year. That's when the Rambam is writing this introduction. As the, some of the commentators point out, there are different parts in the Mishnah Torah where the Rambam gives dates of when he was writing these laws. So for example, in the laws of Kiddush HaChadish, the laws connected to the new moon, in chapter 11, the Rambam mentions the date of the composition of the text as 4938, which means one year later. Later in the Rambam, in Hilchah Shmit he mentions the date 4936, one year earlier, which means that the Rambam didn't write the Mishnah Torah in a few months or even in one year. This was written over a few years. He also went back and revised earlier things he wrote in later years, because later we see a later law he's writing in the year 11, uh, 1176, and this is 1177. It could be he wrote the introduction after he wrote the work, or he wrote the introduction, and then later he went back and he revised the introduction. Whatever the case is, this becomes very significant. It's the year 1177. If the Rambam was born, uh, the Rambam was born, uh, you remember when the Rambam was born? I said it the other day. <laughs> Slipped my mind. Uh, no? 1138. 1135, many say 1138. If he was born 1138, this means that when, when, when did he write this? 1138, so 4858, 6878. So the Rambam was 39 years old. The Rambam was born 1135, so 45, 55, 65, 75. I'm sorry. If the Rambam was born 1135, so then he was, he was 42 years old. 45, 55, 75, he was 42 years old. If he was born 1138, so then he was a few years younger. 48, 58, 68, 78, yes, he was 39 years old. 
These are the years when the Rambam is writing the Mishnah Torah Yad HaChazak. Of course, he would live till the age of 69, uh, almost 70, a few months before he turned 70. So the Rambam now gave us the history after the Talmud. You have the hundreds of years of the Ga'inim. And the Rambam says all of these Ga'inim were involved in God's work to present halacha to the Jewish people in a way that is accessible to people who already can't go back to the original or it's too difficult for them. They are writing works, works that explain the Gemara, works that give halacha to people, and they are answering questions from communities all over the world. Here we are introduced for the first time to the concept of Shaila Sechuvas, right? They send in questions, they get answers, they compile the answers into works so that it can be used by subsequent teachers and students in that generation and in later generations. The Rambam wrote a very long and elaborate introduction to the Mishnah, where this introduction of Mishnah Torah is more brief and concise. Over there, it's extremely, extremely elaborate. And over there, the Rambam mentions the names of some of the texts that he refers to as the texts of the Ga'inim, and it's worthwhile to mention these texts of the Ga'inim. Number one, Halachas G'daylus. Number two, Halachas Psukais. Number one, She'iltais. She'iltais of Reb Achoi Goin. This is known as the She'iltais. And the Halachas of Reb Yitzchak Al-Fasi. The Rif, Reb Yitzchak of Fez, Morocco, Al-Fasi. Reb Yitzchak Al-Fasi, he wrote also Halachas. It's printed at the end of every Gemara. You will see there's a section called the Rif, Reb Yitzchak Al-Fasi. This is one of the works that the Rambam is referring to when he wrote about the works that the Go'enim wrote. And now we are living, we are reading the words written in 1177-1177, 1100 years after the destruction of the second Mesa Mikdash, plus the eighth year. Says the Rambam, These days, The distress, the challenges, of our people have become increasingly worse. The This life of everybody is stressful. People are financially and other ways extremely stressed and tight. It's difficult. And the wisdom of our sages has been lost. And the perceptiveness of those of us who had perception has been concealed. Thus, all the commentary, the laws, the responses that the Ga'inim composed over the last few hundred years, and they felt that it was clear and self-explanatory. Today, these texts became difficult and nobody understands them well. Very few people can really master them. Even the texts of the Ga'inim are incomprehensible to most, besides a few special minds. Now talk about the Talmud itself. He says, the Babylonian Talmud, the Yerushalmi, the Sifra, the Sifri, the Taisefta, which were all composed before the Talmud Bavli. You remember, we learned Bavli by Reb Ashi, Yerushalmi by Reb Yoichen, who was a student of Rabbeinu HaKadosh, Sifra and Sifri by Rav, Taisefta by Reb Chia, student of Rav. And the other works the Rambam mentioned earlier, like the Brises of Reb Oishia, and the Medrashim, and Mechilta. All these, he says, require a Das Rechava. Das Rechava means an experience of mind, a breath of knowledge, nefesh chachama, a wise, perceptive soul, and a lot of time. And then you could deduce from these texts the proper path of what is forbidden, what is permitted, and all of the other laws of Torah. And because of this, I have girded my loins. I, Moshe, the son of Maimon, the Sephardi, the man from Spain. And I leaned on the rock, blessed be he, leaning, finding support in Hashem. I leaned on the rock. I learned and delved into and contemplated all of the texts. And 
and I felt it was appropriate to compose a work with the conclusions of everything that emerges from all of the composed texts about what is forbidden and what is permitted, what is impure, what is pure, and all the other laws of Torah. Kulam, all of them. Beloshen Brura Vederech Tzara. In a clear language and in concise language. Brura means clear. And Tzara, brief, concise, sharp. Those are the two definitions the Rambam gives to his work. Loshen Brura, clear and concise. To the point that all of Teresh of Alpeh, the entire body of the oral tradition of Judaism, which means not the debates, the questions, and the sources, but all of the laws of the whole Teresh of Alpeh that were transmitted from Moshe Rabbeinu all the way down to the generations, all of the laws that were deduced in later generations from the texts, anything that was added as a rabbinic injunction or protection, all of it should be organized in the mouth of every Jew, without questions, without objections. It shouldn't be filled with debates. You read a text, this one says this, this one says this, this one questions this, this one answers this, this one takes it apart, this one takes it further apart. No. My objective is dvarim brurim. I want clear words, kroivim, accessible, nechoinim, correct. Al pi amishpat asher yizborim mikolelu achiburim vaapirushim hanemtzoyim imoyst abenu akadosh vadachshav. According to the verdict, according to the judgment that emerges from all of the texts and all of the commentary that exists from the days of Rabbeinu Hakadosh, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, who was the first one to take Torah Shabbat Pan and put it into an official text, which we call the Mishnah. And Rabbeinu HaKadosh lived approximately a thousand years before the Rambam, around a thousand years, 800, Rabbeinu HaKadosh lived in the beginning of the 200s, the beginning of the 3rd century. The Rambam is now writing at the end of the 12th century. So we're talking about close to a millennium. All the texts from Rabbeinu HaKadosh till now, everything that emerges, Ah, to the point, here is the objective. kol gluyun kol mitzvah mitzvah. All of the laws of all of Judaism should be available and revealed, clear. For the young and the old. For the person who's in young in years, the person who's elder in years. For the person who has a lower intellectual stature or capability and the person who has a grand intellectual stature. This is a work for all of them. Bedin kol mitzvah, mitzvah, and the law of every single mitzvah, 630 mitzvahs, but each mitzvah has so many details and intricacies. Ubedin kol advarim shetikna chacham menervim, including the laws, not only the 630 mitzvahs, but also everything that was instituted by the prophets and the sages. Klobe shal davar, let me sum up my mission statement. Here the Rambam articulates his mission statement in this work. Kedei shaloye he adam tzarech lechibur acher ba'olam medin medine Yisrael. My mission statement is that no human being should require any other work, any other volume in the world in order to know any law that pertains to Jewish law. If you want to learn other things, you will need other volumes. But if you want to know halach, if you want to know all of Jewish law, and this includes also the laws that are not relevant to the times of the Ramah, the laws of the time of the Beis Hamikdash, the laws of the times of Mashiach. If you want to master Every single law in Judaism, from the days of Moshe Rabbeinu till today, the Rambam says, my objective is you should not need any other chibur ba'olam. You should not need any other work. It's all going to be here in this work. I want this chibur, this composition, to encompass the entire oral tradition of Torah. And this includes all the institutions, all the customs, all the decrees that were made from the days of Moshe Rabbeinu until the composition of the Talmud. And he says till the composition of the Talmud, because remember, after the Talmud was created, no institutions oblige all the Jewish people. According and consistent with the commentaries of the Ga'inim in all of their texts that they composed after the Talmud. That's why I gave this work the following name, Mishnei Torah. Mishnei Torah means the second to Torah. 
Mishnah, like from the word Mishnah Lamelech, the second to the king. Sheni, Mishnah, Mishnah Torah, the second to the Torah. What do I mean? The objective is a person should first read through the whole Torah Shabbat. The whole Tanakh, 24 books of Torah, 5 books of Moshe, all the prophets, the Nevi'im, Yeshua, Shoftim, Shmuel, Malachim, Yeshaya, Yirmi, Yecheskel, Treyasser, and then you have the Ksuvim, the writings, like Psalms and Proverbs, Song of Songs, Megillus Esther, Megillus Echa, Kayelus. You read through the whole Torah Shabbat. And then you read this work that the Rambam is about to begin to write, Mishnah Torah of the Rambam, and what happens? And you know the whole Torah Shabbat. You know all of the laws of Judaism, of the oral tradition, which are not in the Tanakh, and you do not need to read any other Sefer. So you have the Torah, and then you have the second to the Torah, Mishnah Torah. Torah Shabbat Sab is the written Torah, and the Rambam's Mishnah Torah is that which complements and fills in the gap of that which was communicated over the generations orally, and that which was deduced over the generations orally, and that which was instituted over the generations orally. Remember those three categories that he keeps on referring to? That which was transmitted orally, that which was deduced over the generations, new circumstances, new laws, and that which was introduced in later generations as rabbinic mitzvahs or injunctions or safeguards. All of this is now in the Mishnah Torah, the second the Torah, and you do not need any other Hebrew, you do not need any other work. And that's why the Rambam says, Na'arti chotzni, I girded my loins. Or there's another version, Shinasti Masnai. I really, this, this, this required so much empowerment. I empowered myself, I girded my loins, I, I, I mobilized myself to do this work such, of such magnitude. I mean, you see the responsibility he's accepting upon himself. The gap that he feels he is going to fill here. To the point, you have Tanakh, you have the work of the Rambam Mishneh Torah, and you don't need any other Chibur. If you want to learn Gemara, of course, you can learn Gemara. But if you, in terms of knowing Halach, every Halach in Torah, of the whole Torah of you don't need any other work. That's what the Rambam writes. This teaches us a lot. I'm going to share with you one insight. I heard myself in 1986, 1986, 85. I heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe shortly after he suggested the daily learning of Rambam. He said, if you remember, the Rambam opens the introduction with a Pasuk in Tehillim, Kufya Tesvav, Tehillim 119.6, Ozle Averj Bahabiti Al Kal Mitzvah Sacha. I will not be ashamed when I gaze at all of your mitzvahs. Why did the Rambam choose this verse as the opening of his introduction? At the surface level, it's because the Rambam is saying, when a person sees all the mitzvahs, it eliminates shame. Until I look at all the mitzvahs, my life is maybe not maximized. I'm not living my full potential as the conduit and as the ambassador of Hashem in this world. And all the mitzvahs represent everything that I'm representing in my life. But the Rambam may also be saying something personal. And that's it. That's it. And, that, and that's the following. Look at his breitkeit. How much, and here there's a word breitkeit. How much, uh, say, guts. For the Rambam to make such a statement, I girded my loins. I, Moshe ben Maimon the Sfardi, <laughs> I leaned on the rock of God. I leaned on the rock of God. Such boldness. And I'm composing the one work that is going to be the ultimate work that complements the Tanakh. And you don't need any other safer. Wow. And these words, by the way, did not go down so easily. Here, we come and we're introduced to the Hasagas HaRaivet. We're going to have a chance yet to talk about the Raivet. But very briefly, this is important information because the Raivet is going to come up throughout the Mishnah Torah. The Raivet was older than the Rambam. He was born around 1120, which means he was approximately 18 years older than the Rambam. The Raivet is an acronym, Rabbeinu Avram Ben David. Avram Ben David. There were three Raivets. He's the third one. He lived in France, in the province, in southern France. 
He's known as the Ravid. He, throughout the Mishnah Torah, he writes comments on the Ravidman, very often arguing with them and sometimes very sharply. They're known as Hasogus HaRavid. So you'll know now, Ravid is Rabbeinu Avram Ben David. He's known as Ravid of Pasquires, which is the city, the area, the region in southern France where he lived, Pasquires. Rabbeinu Avram Ben David. He, right here, criticizes the Rambam very sharply. If you have the Rambam, I have it, Asagas Haraivit. I'll read to you what the Raivit says because this is worthwhile to read in order to appreciate what the Rambam is saying. The Raivit says, and I quote, you can open your Rambam and see it there. It's on the side of the text of the Rambam. Omer Avram, Zaha Mechaber Savar Lesakin Velay Tikin. This author, the Rambam, he tried to repair, he tried to do the right thing, but he did not. He neglected, he abandoned the way of all of the authors till his day. They always bring proofs to their words. They always quote the people from where they got their verdict from. And he says, this is a great benefit. You know why it's a great benefit? Because sometimes a judge wants to give a particular verdict. He has a source for his verdict. Let's say he wants to say, this animal is kosher to eat. Or this person is not guilty. Whatever the situation is. But he doesn't know that one of the greatest authorities in Allah disagreed with him. And he found another source. And if he would know that this great sage disagreed with him because he had another source, this judge today would retract. He would retract from his position. But he says, with the Rambam, he doesn't give any sources. Remember, he doesn't quote any debates. He doesn't quote any questions. He doesn't quote any refutations. He doesn't quote any arguments. He takes out the verdict, the law, the way he understood it from all the texts. So the Ravid says a few lines later, I am a judge, the Ravid says. I have a particular verdict. I open up a Rambam, he disagrees with me. Is this enough to make me retract my position? The Rambam didn't give me his source, so I don't know if this verdict is coming from somebody who's really much greater than me and therefore I should surrender my mind? my opinion to his, or maybe not. Maybe I'm greater than him. I don't know. The Ravid says, you have to quote. Tell me where you're getting it from. Why are you deciding this position against this position? The Ga'inim argued about a lot of things. The Rambam took the, the side that he agreed with. The Ravid says, why should I agree with him? Maybe I want the other side. I have to see both sides. I have to see. I can't just rely on him. I don't know who argued with him. Maybe that person was worthy of arguing with him and his position should be considered. The Ravid says that the Rambam here was going beyond the limits of where a human being should be. This is too presumptuous. He had an extra spirit in him, which the Rambam doesn't see as positive. In other words, that the Rambam elevated the role of his book and the status of his book to a place which was inappropriate. The Rambam. Older than the Rambam, 12th century. Born around 10, around 10, 20 years before the Rambam. The Kesef Mishnah, another great commentator on the Rambam. He's, every page of the Rambam is surrounded by the Kesef. Who's the Kesef Mishnah? Rabbi Yosef Karo. Rabbi Yosef Karo is the author of Shulchan Aruch. He lives in the 15th century. He was born approximately in the year 1488, according to most versions in Spain. He left Spain, 1488. He travels to different locations. He settles in Tzfas, in the Holy Land. He passes away in the year, in the 1570s. So he's a Jew from the 15th century and the 16th century. He's most famous because he wrote the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. But before the Shulchan Aruch, he wrote a commentary on the Torah known as the Beis Yosef. And before that, he writes a commentary on the Rambam called Kesef Mishnah. His name was Yosef. And so he lives in the 1500s. The Ravid and the Rambam lived in the 1100s, a few hundred years later. The Kesef Mishnah often defends the Rambam from the Ravid. And here too, the Kesef Mishnah says, and I'm going to read a few words after he quotes the Ravid, he says, 
Our Rebbe, the Rambam, had a good reason. I say if the Rambam would have been like all the other authors, he would have not given us the benefit he wanted to give us. You already have Rabbi Yitzchak Ilfas, who at the end of every Gemara compiles all of the halachas, and the Rambam usually follows him. But over there, it's filled with so many different associations. It's not so organized. It's not so clear. It's not so brief. There are still debates. It's separated in different shrek dates. The Rambam wanted to give us something sharp, brief, clear, like the mission itself. And he says that every sage couldn't rely on his choice, on the Rambam's choices. And you know what, he says, if there is a great sage and a great genius who doesn't want to rely on the Rambam, he feels that the Rambam's choice of what the verdict is should be questioned. He wants to revisit everything. Says the Kesef Mishnah, who's stopping him? Go back to all the books that the Rambam used. Go back and find the sources and make your own decision. Nobody's stopping you. You can go back there. I say that the path that the Rambam chose fixed up the whole world. It was something beneficial for the whole Jewish world. Besides one in a generation who doesn't want to rely on and wants to go back to the sources, go back to the sources. You know what? Even for that one genius of a generation who really wants to go back to the sources and do the work of the Ramam himself, the Ramam did well for him too. You know why? Sometimes he's in a rush. He doesn't have time. He, he knows that the Rambam says this, he could rely on it. He could rely on the Rambam if he's in a rush. And even if he's not in a rush and he wants to research everything, thank God he has the Rambam because it's not a small thing to know how the Rambam believed, what the Rambam thought. So even for him, it's beneficial to see the verdict of the Rambam. This is how the Kesef Mishnah defends the Rambam from the Ravid. I should note historical interesting fact that years later, the Rambam wrote a letter to a student of his and he says that he did regret that he did not write the sources of every single law in the Mishnah Torah. Even though the Rambam says here he doesn't want to write questions and refutations and arguments. Why? Somebody came to him and asked him for the source of something he wrote and he was certain it was in one place and then he was certain it was in another place and then he was certain it was in another place and really it was elsewhere. It was scattered somewhere, and the Rambam didn't recall it immediately. It took him time. The Rambam says, if the author himself had to go back and figure out where I took it from, what about all my readers? So the Rambam did feel that he should have put in the sources. But in reality, at this point, the Rambam decided not to put in any sources, just to give the final verdict of Malacha, and we see what his ambition is. Where does the Rambam get this great guy, this power? That's why he opens the Pasuk. A person has to know his potential in life. The Rambam says, when I know that I looked and I studied and I comprehended and I mastered all the mitzvahs, which means not only the Tanakh, the Mishnah and the Baal and Yerushalmi and Tosefta and Sifra and Sifri and Mechil Tad Rebbe Kiva, Mechil Tad Rebbe Shema, and all the Chiburim of the Ga'inim, and all of the commentaries and all of the Midrashim, and I mastered it all. Ozlei Eivosh. Now is not the time for shame. Now is not the time for fake humility. Now is not the time to say, who am I? What am I? Who do I think I am? That's why he begins with this passage. When you know that you have mastered something, now you have a responsibility to yourself, to the people, to the world, to God, to Jewish history, to take a pen and give people the experience of Kol Mitzvah Sech. As the Rambam himself quotes later from the Gemara Masech the Saita, that just like a person, who doesn't know halacha, and he starts giving people guidance. It's a terrible crime, an equal crime, is somebody, call me of somebody who could teach, somebody who could guide, somebody who could mentor, and he doesn't, he abstains. That is an equal crime. You would think, oh, I'm humble. No, you were given this gift, atsumim kolarugev, very sharp words about somebody who has the ability to lead, guide, mentor, teach, give. And he or she abstains from it. The Rambam says, knowing that I could rely on the rock, 
I'm work doing Hashem's work. I'm relying on the rock. The Rambam, in his great humility, and the humility of the Rambam is seen throughout every word of his writing, any work, you could see the humility of the Rambam, understood this is his role, this is part of his mission in life. Ozlei Evash, Bahabiti, El Kal Mitzvah The Rambam says, after my book, you don't need anything else. Is this hubris? Is this pompous? Even if it's unprecedented and gigantic, can you say such a thing? Would the Chafetz Chaim say such a thing? Would Rabbi Yosef Karo such a, say such a thing? Would the Vilna Gaon say such a thing? Would the Alter Rebbe say such a thing? It's very important to emphasize this again and again. It would be intellectually dishonest and foolish to accuse the Rambam of arrogance. Anyone who learns the Rambam's works, reads his letters, even superficially, you could see the profound humility that this person professed. Incredible. I believe that to argue that is really ignoring and denying the facts. And not just from a place of faith and, you know, hopeful wishes, but from literally reality of studying the Rambam and anything we know about him. And also reading what he writes about humility and reading what he writes about hypocrisy. We're going to get there. In Hilchis Day is the laws of ethics. He discusses humility. And he discusses hypocrisy. The way the Rambam writes about humility, you see what he believed about humility. But of course, this has to be understood completely different. And that's why I explained what I heard from the Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe, When you know that God blessed you with a specific skill, talent, gift, resource, perception, wisdom, and ability... Not to use it to its fullest measure and degree is actually a betrayal of the mission which your soul was sent down to the world for. And to say, I'm humble, I'm I'm, I'm a humble person, I'm embarrassed, I'm shy. If you know that you mastered all the mitzvahs and there is a desperate need in the Jewish world for your contribution, you don't have a right to abstain even if you are truly humble and self-effacing. The Rambam here was not celebrating his prowess, his genius, his skill. After me, you don't need anybody else. The Rambam was celebrating here the light that God was transmitting through him. Listen to my words. The Rambam was celebrating himself as a conduit. I'm completely supported by the rock. I'm just a representative of the Tzur. Tzur Yisrael Begoyale, the rock of Israel and its redeemer. That's the words he writes. Tzur. Why does he use the word Tzur for Hashem? Because he wants to bring out that his whole source of confidence, the rock, the strength, the fortitude, comes from the Rebbein Hashem. I rely on this rock. To do what? To fill this void that people should be able to master and know all of Halacha to the point that they know when they learn the Tanakh and they have here, they have this book, they have all of Halacha. And the Rambam accentuates it to bring out the great gift that God gave him to be able to give to the Jewish people. I think that is the true way to understand this. Here I have to mention God's sense of humor. What's God's sense of humor? (laughs) The Rambam says, after you read my book, you don't need any other work in the world. (laughs) You don't need any other chibra in the world. You have Tanakh. You have Mishnah, Torah, you don't need to look in another book for halacha. Now what's Hashem's sense of humor? There is not a single work in Jewish law and Jewish history that has so many books written on it. Like what? Like the Rambam's Mishnah, Torah. I'm not talking about 10 books. I'm not talking about 20 books, which is also a lot. I'm not talking about 100 books. I'm talking about thousands, thousands of works throughout the generations from the 1100s until this very day, to elucidate, to explain, to enlighten us, to delve into every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every halacha of the Rambam, from different styles and different perspectives, the Rambam's mission of Torah became what a honey lahavdil, became the, the honey for the bee lahavdil, the Rambam's mission of Torah became the reference point where every halachic master, teacher, Talmudist, sage, Rosh Hashiva throughout the generations goes to figure out, first of all, his sources. Because he didn't write sources, but he went to figure out his sources. 
to see his definitions, to understand how he learned the Gemara, how he learned the Halacha. The Rambam says, after this, you won't need another work. But after this, more works were added to the library of Judaism than through any other work in Jewish history. Mishnah Torah Yad HaChazak Rambam. In fact, people were worried with those who criticized the you're eliminating the Gemara from the bookshelf. You're eliminating the Gemara. You say Tanakh and you. And you. But Ram wasn't eliminating the Gemara. Ram was just saying, I want a book where everyone could see all of Halach. Those who are going to learn Gemara are great. But the truth is, through the Rambam, much more learning of Gemara increased than ever before in order to be able to figure out how the Rambam learned the Gemara. From the Rambam, you go back to the Gemara, you want to see how the Rambam saw the Gemara. There were those who said that the many did not use the word Mishnah Torah because of the Ravid's, uh, the Ravid's comments and other people's comments that you should make a work that's second to Torah. They felt that, again, this was above the boundaries of a human being. And there's another name that's very popular, maybe more popular for the Rambam's work called Yad HaChazaka. Yad HaChazaka means the strong arm. It comes from the end of Chumash. Yad HaChazaka Asha Moshe. His name was Moshe, Moshe ben Maimon, Yad HaChazaka, the strong arm, because Yad is a hand, and Yad is Yud Dalad, which is 14, because Yad HaChazaka consists of 14 books in which the Rambam categorized and systemized all of Jewish law. So that's also a very popular name called Yad HaChazaka. Did it develop because people didn't want the name Mishnah Torah? Some people say that, that there were a few individuals in Jewish history who gave very big names, titanic names for their works, and their work, their names did not last. The Rambam's Mishnah Torah is, is more known as Yad HaChazaka. The Shalah, 16th and 17th century, wrote a sefer called Shnei Luchos Habris, the two tablets of stone. And what is it known? Most people don't say Shnei Luchos Habris, they say Shalah, which is the acronym of Shnei Luchos Habris. And the third one, you know the third one is? The al The al wrote a commentary called Toiras Moshe. His name was Moshe, Reb Moshe al from Tzvas, 1500s, Tzvas. We don't call it Toiras Moshe, we call it the al this I once saw, I think the Chidah writes this. Somebody writes, one of the greats writes it, that these three names, Mishnah, Torah, Shnei Luchas Abris, and, uh, and, uh, and Alshech, Torah, Moshe, the Jewish people changed the name a little bit. Yad HaChazaka, Shalah, and, and Alshech. Very interesting observation. Let's see the last paragraph, another few lines in the Rambam's introduction. So the Rambam gave us a name, he gave us his mission statement, but you see, you learn also from this introduction how to think about what you're going to write. <laughs> I think in today's generation it's very important. When everybody has a computer and everybody is writing books and everybody is sending messages and everybody is an uh, expert on everything, or at least many people think they're experts, look at how a person prepares to write a work, his introduction, how he starts off. He gives you the bird's eye view, the perspective, how things developed until his day. What inspired him? What is the need that he's filling? Whenever you write a work, you have to explain to the people. What void are you filling? What would be missing if you were not here? So many people write books. What would be missing if you didn't write this book? The Rambam articulates here the void, the challenge, the dilemma, the problem, the gap that he is coming to fill. He also articulates a mission statement, what his objective is, and that's why. When you read through, you learn through Mishnah Torah, which is not a, it's a long work. You see every line is an expression of this mission statement. There's no, the Ramam is sitting one day and he decides to write some interesting poetry. The Ramam has a lot of other works with other genres, with other mission statements. He's loyal to the mission statement. This is the goal. This is the objective. Every single line of Mishneh Torah is going to be a manifestation of this mission statement. There's so much to learn from this introduction outside of the introduction itself. The Rambam finishes. I decided the best way is to divide this work into halachas halachas, which means into sections of laws, different halachas, which means you'll have the laws of tefillin, mezuzah, sefer Torah, the laws of davening, the laws of repentance, the laws of Torah study, the laws of a borrower and a lender, the laws of kings, the laws of judges, the laws of grief, different halachas, the laws of sale, 
the laws of servants, laws of borrowing, of renting. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing out different halachas. Halachas, sections, 14 books. But within each book, it's going to be sections. We're going to see there's 83 sections of halachas, 83 categories. V'achalik halachas leprakim shabai senya. The halachas, each halacha is divided into chapters. A halacha can have 10 chapters, can have three chapters, it can have 30 chapters or more. There's going to be chapters, all the same theme, and the chapters are organized. Well, first chapter we discussed this, second chapter this, he builds. It's built like a pyramid, very organized. Every chapter is divided into small paragraphs, small sections. We call it small halachas. So for example, whenever you want to reference a Rambam, you're going to say, Mishnah Torah laharambam, or Yad HaChazaka laharambam, Hilchis Tshuva, the laws of repentance, Perik Aleph, the first chapter, Halacha Gimel, the third section, the third paragraph, or Halacha Dalar, or Halacha Aleph. That's how you reference the Rambam. Why did I do this? They he's doing it Malpeth. So people should be able to memorize it by heart. It should be organized on everybody's mouth. Because everything is so referenced and categorized and divided. So you know, this the subject is here and there and there. And you go there and you can pinpoint it easily. This is a couple of years pre-Google. Elu ha'alacha she'bechol inyan ve'inyan. These halachas in every theme of Torah, yesh men ha'alacha she'en mishpatei mitzvah achas bolvat. There are halachas that will only include one mitzvah of Torah. V'hi ha'mitzvah she'esh badivne kabola ha'arbi v'inyan mifne atzma. This may be a mitzvah that has a lot of traditions around it, and but it's an independent theme. V'yesh men ha'alacha she'en kodlis mishpatei mitzvah ha'arbi. You'll have halachas that include many different mitzvahs, all in this theme. As long as the mitzvahs are about one issue. Because the way I organize this work is not according to the number of mitzvahs. Rather, it's according to themes, topics. So for example, if you go to the laws of repentance, there's only one mitzvah there. It's the mitzvah of repentance. But it has 10 chapters because the mitzvah of tshuva includes a lot. So many details, but they're all in one halach. You'll have Hilchas Avoid Zara, the laws of idolatry. That doesn't have one mitzvah, that has in Chumash many, many mitzvahs, but they will all be compressed to Hilchas Avoid Zara. Why? Because he didn't give every mitzvah a separate halacha. He divided it according to themes. You'll have Hilchas Shabbos. Hilchas Shabbos has many mitzvahs, but they're all in Hilchas Shabbos. It's connected to the celebration and observance of Shabbos. You'll have Hilchis Megillah and Hanukkah. That doesn't even have one mitzvah. It's a rabbinic mitzvah. A rabbinic mitzvah. Mitzvah of Megillah, mitzvah of Hanukkah. The Rambam puts all the laws over there, etc. The number of the mitzvahs of Torah that are relevant for all of the generations are 613 mitzvahs. There are mitzvahs that were only given for that time in history. An example of that would be Parshas Matos, the Rebbeinu Shalom says that the spoil of Midian, the Jews fought Midian because Midian wanted to, wanted, had this genocidal plan for the Jewish people. The Jews fought Midian and they had a lot of spoil. And Hashem tells Moshe that spoil should be divided equally between the troops who went to fight and all of the other Jews, 50-50, and a tax should be imposed on each part. The part that's given to the Jewish people, one of 50 should be given to the Levites. And the part that's given to the troops, one of 500 should be given to the high priest, Elaza. This is a mitzvah. But it's not a mitzvah that you're going to find in the list of 613 mitzvahs. You know why? It's not for generations. It only applied for that time. So that's why the Rambam says, L'doyros. It's for generations. Now the mitzvahs in the Beis HaMikdash, they're not applicable now, but they are applicable now. It's just the circumstances are not here. If we would have a Beis HaMikdash, which we should have speedily in our days, the mitzvahs will apply. So that's not called a temporary mitzvah. A mitzvah for generations doesn't mean a mitzvah that we don't do now. It means if we would have the circumstances that would allow us to do the mitzvah, we would do the mitzvah. Just like we're not eating matzah now, not because it's not an eternal mitzvah, it's just because it's not Pesach. If it would be Pesach, we would have the mitzvah of matzah. So that's an important distinction we have to make. Any mitzvah that applies theoretically to all of the generations, even if practically we don't do it now because we can't, we can't, I don't have the ability to do it, but if it theoretically applies to all the generations, there's 613 mitzvahs. 
Now it's interesting, this doesn't say in Chumash. Chumash doesn't give us the number 613. But this is an ancient tradition, the Gemara discusses it at the end of Maseches Makos, that we have a tradition that is 613 mitzvahs. Mehen mitzvahs me'essei, masayim barboi mushmoyna. Some of them are positive commandments, 248 positive. Simen le'en minyan avar of shaladam. A symbol to remember them is the number of the limbs of a human being, 248. According to the sages, they divided, they categorized the human anatomy into 248 limbs and organs. I know in the contemporary number, we usually talk about 206 bones, I believe. So there's been a lot of discussion of how the sages decided to categorize the limbs of the human being and the number becomes 248, which the Rambam says corresponds to the 248 mitzvahs. Then you have 365 prohibitions that relate to the negative, things that you don't do. There are 248 things that we do, and there are 365 things that we abstain from doing. Simon Lehan, a symbol, or to rem- a sign to remember this number is Minyan Yemei Shnei Sachama. The number of, the number of, the, 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 the number of days that constitutes a solar year. If we view, from our perspective, if we view the sun making a full orbit around the earth, it takes 365 days and change. 365 days is the number of days that completes every single year the solar orbit, and that's what we call a year. That's why we have a year. What makes a year 365 days? Something objectively happens after 365 days, and the cycle repeats itself. And during that cycle, we have all the seasons of spring and summer, etc., because that is the solar year, and that's 365. Now, this is not just random associations, but as the Medrash puts it, and the Rambam quotes it in another work, say for HaMitzvahs, that it would be like every single limb talks to the person and says, please, do a mitzvah with me. Utilize me to do a mitzvah so I could fulfill my purpose and I could be harmonized and aligned with my divine purpose. So each limb of the 248 limbs asks you to do a mitzvah with it. And each day of the 365 days a year asks you, says, please use me productively. Don't Take my time and use it for something you should not be doing. It's like every day of the 365 days of the year pleads with you and says, please, carpe diem, seize the day, pun intended, seize the day. Make sure that this day is a day in which you utilize in the most productive and powerful way not to use it for something that you shouldn't be doing. That's the simon of the mitzvahs. 300, 365 things we don't do, 248 things we do. This concludes the Rambam's introduction to Mishnah Torah. From here, the Rambam doesn't start yet the laws. The Rambam now gives a whole list of the 630 mitzvahs before he begins to explain them. What are the 630 mitzvahs? That's the next section. Now he goes through a list, a brief list, one sentence, each one of the 630 mitzvahs. Then after that, he goes through the 365, 248 and 365, and then afterwards, he gives you a blueprint of his work, how he divided Judaism into 14 books, and in those 14 books he compressed and he inserted 83 subjects, 83 themes, and each one of those themes has its chapters, as we learned before. And altogether you have a thousand halachas in the work of the Rambam, because you have 14 books, 83 halachas, but in each one, you have chapters, so you have a thousand, a thousand uh, prakam, a thousand chapters. So the Rambam, before he starts the book, he gives you an index because it's very clear that he wanted here the full scope, the bird's eye view. So he gives an index. He wants you to know all the 630 mitzvahs and he wants you to see the blueprint of his entire book of how he's, it's going to be laid out. And then he actually starts the first laws known as Hilchis Yisaidiya Torah, the fundamentals of Torah. I think you said that after the Talmud was closed by Rabashi, no court could make a decision affecting all communities. And no decree of Bezdin could bind another one. Don't we have a rule that a Bezdin cannot cancel another Bezdin's ruling if the latter Bezdin is not greater than the earlier one? That only applies to the Sanhedrin. That's all before the Talmud Bavli. The Rambam is talking about post-Talmud Bavli, that law doesn't apply. The edict of a Bezdin in one place does not bind the Jews in another place, even if they're not greater. Were there not groups that did not accept the learning of Rambam? 
please list the times of classes in Israel for those of us here in Israel. I live in Beitar Elite Israel. Yes, you see from the Raivet that there was an opposition. Some people opposed the works of the Rambam, the work of the Rambam, his style. There were other arguments that people had. I mentioned some of them in, in, in the, these words of the Raivet and the Kasef Mishnah. But the fact remains that even if you argued with the Rambam, he became the person to argue with. In other words, his work is considered the greatest halachic work that was written in Jewish history. The greatest or one of the greatest, probably the greatest. So the Rambam's work, whether you agreed, you didn't agree. Remember, the Rambam, as the Ravid says, saw arguments and he chose one opinion to give a verdict. He didn't bring the arguments. So the Rambam had to use his own mind often to navigate between different opinions, contentious opinions, and make a decision. The Ravid says, what if I disagree with them? I want to go back to the sources, and maybe I'll have a different verdict. The Rambam himself, sometimes the Ga'inim are arguing, and he makes a verdict. Or there's arguments in the Gemara, or there's arguments elsewhere, and there was no verdict given in Talmud Bavli, or a consensus by the Ga'inim, and the Rambam himself will choose the verdict. So some people said, I want to go back. Also, what if the interpretation in Gemara is different? Maybe I have a different interpretation in the Gemara. The Rambam didn't tell you. I went back to the Gemara. You could learn it this way. You could learn it that way. I decided to learn it this way. And therefore, this is the verdict. The Rambam doesn't do that. He just gives you the verdict. But it became unbelievably fascinating to Jewish scholars since then to find out what the Rambam thought. How he thought about it. I once heard from Rabbi Yitzchak Tversky, Rabbi Izidor Tversky, who was a son-in-law of Rabbi Yosh, Rabbi Yosh Bersalavechik, he was also a professor of Judaic studies in Harvard University. He was also a genius, and he was also a grandson. Tversky was, he considered, uh, he, he, he identified himself also as a Rebbe, Tolner Rebbe, and he was a grandson of the Tversky dynasty, Reb Nachum Chernobyl, Reb Matulut Chernobyl, the Chernobyl Maggot. His name was Reb Yitzchak Tversky. He passed away a few years ago. He has a son who was killed in Harnof, I believe. You remember the massacre in Harnof in the morning? I think that was his son. So Rabbi Yitzchak Tversky, I was once by him in, uh, in his Shver Shul in Brookline in Massachusetts. So he told the story. I think he said that he heard it from his father-in-law that uh, the Beis HaLevi, Rabbi Yosheh Ber Salavechik, the Beis HaLevi, the Rav of Slutsk, a brisk, before the Roshiva of Alashen, they were talking about the Shidduch, uh, a partner, a marriage partner for his son, Rabbi Chaim, Rabbi Chaim Salavechik, Rabbi Chaim Briske. So he wanted to extol the virtue of his son, Reb Chaim. And he said, my son, he said, my son, my son, can gans Talmud Bavli mit pirush from Rambam. My son knows the whole Babylonian Talmud with the Rambam's commentary. And this raised eyebrows. The Rambam wrote a commentary on many tractates of Gemara, but we don't have them. They were lost. I don't know if you know that. Many Mesechtes of Shas, the Rambam's output was incredibly prolific. That's even the works we have. But there's so many works we don't have from the Rambam. They were lost, tragically lost. We don't have the commentary of the Rambam on Gemara. Besides that he didn't, I don't think he wrote a commentary on the whole Gemara. We don't even have it. We have, I think, parts of Mesechte Rosh Hashanah commentary a little bit. But most of it we don't have. What does he mean? Reb Chaim knows the whole Gemara with the Rambam's commentary? You could say the Gemara with Rashi's commentary, with Toysvus's commentary. But not whether you could say with the Rajva, with the Ramban, with the Ran, with the Ritva. I mean, with, the, with Reb Chaim's commentary. So Rabbi Tversky explained that the Beis HaLevi was trying to say that that was the greatness of Reb Chaim. When he learned Rambam, he didn't only learn the words of the Rambam. He understood how the Rambam is learning the Gemara. So he learned the whole Gemara with the commentary of the Rambam. So that's why the Rambam, even if you disagreed with his methodology or style, it became a fountainhead of innovation, of awareness, of depth, and of an understanding how to learn the Gemara. And of course, Rebchaim Soloveitchik developed what's known today as the brisker, the Briske Derech in his monumental work, Chidush Rabbeinu Chaim Alevi Al Rambam. That was his path. But then you had so many other commentators. You had a contemporary, the Rokat Shabbat, Safnas Paneich on the Rambam. And over there, he reveals in the Rambam untold layers of depth. <laughs> he used to say that the Rambam knew, the Rambam that he can't learn, and the Rambam knew how to learn. In any case, that's, I think, uh, some of the points here. Next question. 
Moshe Rabbeinu received the oral Torah, and then there's only one opinion. He didn't teach it this way or that way. By the time of Rabbi Huda Anasi writing the Mishnah, there were discrepancies in the law that crept in. So the truth is that the Rambam says, most things that were received from Moshe on Har Sinai, there were no debates. There are maybe a few exceptions. The Rambam himself says there's no exceptions. The Chavos Yair argues with that, but it's not for now. But most things that come from Moshe Rabbeinu, there's no debate. The debate mostly, the debates mostly crept in in issues that were not clearly articulated in the tradition. For example, new circumstances come up and you have to use the pre-existing text to develop or deduce a new law that relates to new circumstances or even to old circumstances, but certain details and nuances in the law that were never articulated. This is where they had to use the formula of Torah together with their own minds, and that's why there's so many debates. Or sometimes debates sprung up if we should add the safeguard to a mitzvah. Or should we add this institution? Should we make this cause? Should we make this tradition? This is also where many debates crept in. We read about the Rambam saying that in his times, people were so distressed financially, scattered, overwhelmed, wisdom was concealed, people not getting it. <laughs> it sounds like he's writing in 2020. <laughs> he's writing in 1177. <laughs> At the time of the Rambam, circa 1200, in England, the source of England, English common law, which is the source of American law, when one person claimed another owed him money, a court case, they settled it by getting on their horses with long spears, and the survivors of the battle won the court case. The earliest semblance of written organized laws in England were the Blackstone commentaries in the 1600s. Yes. That is amazing. That is amazing. The Rambam is writing this in 1177, and he's not inventing. He's articulating a tradition that goes back thousands of years. And you say 1200 in England, which is the source of English, of English common law, the source of American law, the levels of barbarity and primitiveness were quite, quite horrific. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.